Uh, please be upstanding, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, and his wife, Sabina Higgins. President Higgins, you are most welcome to this, the uh, Social Justice Ireland's 30th anniversary policy conference, and we are delighted and honoured, President, that you have agreed to deliver our keynote address today. You've had a long association with Social Justice Ireland. In 1992, you made a short video, video presentation for us on the subject of citizen participation. Since then, you have engaged with us on many occasions, studying our publications and engaging actively in discussions on them. Sean has described to me a lunchtime discussion you had recently when you produced seven Social Justice Ireland volumes, all annotated, and proceeded to interrogate them on their, <laughs> their contents. My own first encounter with you goes back further than that. You won't remember it, but I do remember a day in 1979 at a Kolov seminar in Galway, which you addressed, together with Maura Gagan Quinn, then a newly appointed minister and the first woman cabinet minister since the foundation of the state. And I remember well a number of things you said that day. The most striking was a comment you made after the minister had spoken and departed, as ministers are wont to do. You drew our attention to our constant reference to my department having done this and my department planning to do that. And you said it was time that ministers realized that it was not their department, but our department. And that was delivered in your usual passionate style. Which brings us to the theme of our conference today, reconnecting people and the state. In your final address to Dáil Éireann in 2011, you focused on the nature of our republic. You lamented the failure of those who founded the state to deliver on the promise of a real republic based on active citizenship. A republic that would have created a floor of citizenship below which people would not be allowed to fall. Instead, you pointed out, such a republic was stolen from the people by the conservatives that took over the state. In your inaugural address, you said it was time to close that chapter on that which was not the best version of ourselves as a people and that this would require a change in our political thinking, in our institutions, and most difficult of all, in our consciousness. You have worked tirelessly as president to bring about that change of consciousness. Social Justice Ireland shares your vision. For 30 years now, we too have worked to create an inclusive society that would guarantee the basic rights required for a dignified life for all our citizens. Our annual conference is an opportunity to reflect on how this endeavor is proceeding, to take stock, and to find inspiration that will regalvanize us in our efforts. We are confident, President, that we'll find that inspiration in your words to us today. May I invite you now to address us. the social justice island us and quire ven shale vacus firkin forgere beats on the top baller as a tata ulterior lar justin may i thank you first, first of all for your kind introduction and may i also as i just said in irish thank social justice island for their invitation to address this conference. I also have the benefit of having read two 
magnificent papers from uh, Lorenzo Tanucci and Michael Darrestadt, and I, I congratulate them on that. I, I was very pleased when I got the invitation that Dr. Healy included his paper, which had a quote from the late Dr. T.K. Whittaker in the preface of the programme. Last year I had the opportunity of reflecting on Dr. Whittaker's life, a life dedicated to the service of this society and its citizens. And I quoted then, and may I again, and may I quote now, what he offered as his vision of economic expansion, economic expansion as means, not an end. Let us remember that we are not seeking economic progress for purely materialistic reasons, but because it makes possible relief of hardship and want, the establishment of a better social order, the raising of human dignity, and eventually the participation of all who are born in Ireland in the benefits, moral and cultural, as well as material, of spending their lives and bringing up their families in Ireland. I think that T.K. Whittaker had, over his career, been in touch with the London School of Economics, and you can see an echo of the great Harl Lasky in such a vision. The theme of this conference also echoes such a vision, addressing the changes and the fracture in the relationship between the citizen and society. And this indeed has been a matter of great importance for me throughout the presidency that you have referred to. It is a relationship that was fraying long before the onset of the global financial crisis. But it has markedly deepened a loss of cohesion in these last 10 years. Aggravated by a global macroeconomic policy response, they saw the losses in so many countries. The losses socialised, while the gains of the financial sector were not just privatised, but concentrated at the peak of the wealth and income pyramid. On the other hand, unprecedented programmes of austerity became mainstream for citizens and countries reeling from the consequences of an era that is characterised by a new form of likely regulated speculative capital. May I contend that at the heart of our present discontent lies a deep and growing disjunction in the distribution of power and authority, not simply between the citizen and the state, but between the state and legally protected concentrations of wealth and power, namely incorporated and non-incorporated organisations, and then in turn between the citizen and the actions and policies of those same organisations. In short, we're coming from a period when the state has retreated or been ideologically pushed to retreat or redefine its role. The citizen's social opportunity to fully participate or flourish, as many social philosophers would put it now, has been diminished and unaccountable sources of wealth and power have very significantly advanced. In place of public or common modes of allocating resources, we've witnessed the expansion of what is often simply referred to in a form of shorthand, as it were, as justification for policy, we are responding to the market. This is offered as the preeminent justification for a taken for granted method of determining and distributing wealth and power in our society. Such phrases come from a strategic and in so many places hegemonic discourse, one that serves and rewards a small set of wealth owners, our managers compensated for speculative skills, and at the same time such language serves as a form of mystification, one aimed at hiding the suggestion of inevitability. But in recent times, that language has come to be simply perceived as harsh by an increasing number, particularly those on what I have so often referred to as the European street. The grounding, domain assumptions of that hegemonic version are not part of our daily discourse. And we must ask why. After all, the transition in its day 
between the theory of moral sentiments of Adam Smith in 1759 and his later The Wealth of Nations, 1776, drew a quite extensive debate in the 18th century. I think that the changes in contemporary international economies have not come anything near such a, an exchange. They are rather presented in our times as nearly inevitable and are being delivered as a sole policy choice to public suffering, the burden of what Pope Francis has called a plague of indifference. This includes not just the authors of policy, but weary publics that are looking away, tired, averting their gaze from deepening inequalities, the welfare of workers, the plight of migrants, Pope Francis was referring to publics that in the absence too of a technical literacy felt that they could not initiate change, were forced to accept what was socially damaging as inevitable. They'd come to believe almost as what that early hate phrase said. There weren't people who would understand the complexity. Responding to the necessary transformation of this relationship between economy and society is an urgent priority in times that are marked in the absence of an adequate and inclusive discourse, and I believe as a consequence by the rise of an ever more rancorous rhetoric, often sourced in despair, alienation, enemy, exclusion, which produces statements that seek to divide us against one another on the grounds of ethnicity, religion and nationality. Even today I was thinking of a new form of fake news, which I'll have to address on another occasion, fake Soros in one of the countries of the European Union. The persistence of a failure to critique or challenge the unstated assumptions of a political economy, which maintains and even deepens existing inequalities of income, wealth, power and opportunity within societies and between nation states, is eroding social cohesion. These inequalities and wealth accumulation are often delivered to the public by our media as celebrations of individual genius. The absence of the inclusive discourse has in too many places too, as I've said, led to the recrudescence of a vicious politics of the far right that in form, content and iconography many of us had hoped never to see again. I do not wish to speculate at length here today on the origins, traje trajectory or destination of these terrifying new political forces, all of which raise complex questions, except, except to reflect that political formations of the far right draw in part on the support of those who feel disconnected from the democratic political communities of which they are putatively members, and they feel disenfranchised in their social and economic lives. Language matters, words matter, as Vassal Pavel was so fond of reminding us. I do, not, I do want to urge caution on the misuse of language, words, concepts, concepts such as populism, to dismiss the excluded simply as negative carriers of populism is simply wrong. There have been, after all, popular movements that initiated change in the, for the purpose of achieving or deepening democracy, for achieving universal health provision, for achieving decent housing, for achieving social protection. I sense that this issue of the missing critical discourse that we need, I think this is good. It is now coming to the fore, and this conference, I suggest, and the papers that you will be hearing, in fact, are quite valuable in that respect. The silence is being broken. I believe we are entering a period of time in which, for the first time in many years, the future shape of the European Union will become a matter of contestation and everyday debate. And as we begin to listen or induced or induced to listen, forced to listen to the European street, the voices may at first appear as incoherent, discordant, incoherent to those of us who may have had the advantage of decades of occasional or adequate sporadic engagement with the institutions of the European Union. We must not be afraid. In the coming debates, we will have an opportunity 
to draw on the best moments of our national and European histories, including those significant moments of our most egalitarian and humane traditions, and on the rich sources of solidarity, humanism, innovation and capacity, which can inform and transform the experience of the European street. And I often think, among the most powerful in the European Union, how often do they ever hear a reference to the philosophical tradition of Europe, France, Germany, and so on? When did you last hear a German philosopher quoted? When French philosopher did you hear quoted? We are reaching a critical juncture for indeed at a moment when it is clear that the Union cannot be adequately be reconstructed from above, as rather must be renewed and rebuilt from below. And I'm not speaking about a couple of countries in the European Union speaking of the future of the European Union and that the issue is simply the exclusion of other countries. I'm simply saying something much stronger, that it cannot be reconstructed from above. This is necessary, this reconstruction from below, if we are to recover even a semblance of authenticity for the concept of union itself. And that is what the streak asks, authenticity. The if the concepts that were invoked at the founding of the union, offered as legitimation again and again of its treaties, are not to be construed as an empty rhetoric, this task of reconstruction must carry authenticity. Again, I use the term rhetoric with care. Rhetoric has been in the past and can be again emancipatory if it re reveals an authentic intention or purpose and is delivered with consistent practice. And one of our tasks in the next decade must be to restore the cohesiveness of our communities here at home in this country and in the European Union, to elevate once again the project of the universal citizen the welfare and the role of participating citizens in making and shaping their own lives and the lives of their communities. This necessary task, if undertaken with ethical intent, I suggest, can contribute to rebuilding and sustaining our capacity and our willingness as citizens, human beings, to work together to lead fulfilling lives in all spheres of human activity. For it is only by restoring social cohesion that we can confront the great challenges that lie ahead. Global challenges, the requirement for just and sustainable development, the urgent necessity to address the causes and consequences of climate change, the imperative for welcoming those fleeing from war, persecution, famine and natural disasters. Being forced to remember that concept that goes across all the belief systems of the world, hospitality, I often feel like asking, you know, the difference it would have made if we, were, if we had been considering the concept given to us by Immanuel Kant, cosmopolitanism, as a source of our thought, reconciling as it does the best of internationalism in human instincts and ethical practice at home. If we had made that reflection, rather than relying on, un on an uncritical uh, acceptance of the term globalisation, which is important, but which really is interconnected trade. To achieve any new departure, we must be very clear of the causes of our present distempers, I suggest. And so I'm very pleased that many of the papers that will be presented here today reflect on and describe some of the manifold sources of the fracturing of the triadic relationship between state, citizen and society the growing inequalities in wealth and income within and between nations and regions, and the rise of new forms of work characterised by precariousness and the threat to or even curtailment of some of the most foundational elements of our systems of social protection. May I suggest that we must first acknowledge that these changes in our society are not natural phenomena. They are not the result of the inevitable laws of history or economics. They are the results of a distinctive set of policies and a political philosophy which has been pursued over the past 40 years that has become, that, to the point that it has become what the French call the pensée unique, the single permitted form of political and economic thought. In acknowledging this, we are challenging a discourse 
which assumes and often boldly asserts that amongst all the means, the models of theory and practice by which we may organise the distribution, consumption, production and exchange of resources in our societies, that there are only a few options or sources of policy which may even be countenanced. I am speaking, of course, of the theory of politics we know as neoliberalism, a term initially used by a very small group of radical economic thinkers to describe a distinctive and marginal economic and social philosophy, developed as a minority view in an age when governments of left and right defended at home the consensus of the Keynesian welfare state and abroad the international economic order, as symbolised by the Bretton Woods Agreement, Neoliberalism offered a radical alternative view, a vision of human society, simultaneously drawing on a version of the liberalism of the past and what it saw as the technological possibilities of the future. Neoliberalism is now widely recognised as a term which describes a philosophy of government, one which has elevated the simplifying in assumption of women of woman or man, and it was mostly man in the literature, as a utility maximising economic agent, motivated by a form of instrumental rationality, as was suggested in neoclassical economics, to now be, as advocated by more fundamentalist adherence to the credo, to be an organising credo of all human activity. Self-interest is elevated into the status of an uncontestable assumption and perhaps often claimed as the only moral idea. Its ethic of liberty is in Milton Friedman's dictum in Capitalism and Freedom, the absence of coercion of a man by his fellow man. Based upon these two foundational principles, Friedrich von Hayek took from Ludwig von Mises a new term, catalaxy. He took it from antiquity to describe the process by which relative prices guide and coordinate production and consumption, revealing and satisfying the preferences of the rational individuals imagined by neoliberals. It was an interesting development because it was an alternative usage to, for example, economy, based on Aristotle's economia, which meant how you direct a single household. Hague's term was to refer to a group of individuals interacting in accordance with their shared self-interest. And hence in time, you would hear the phrase, an immortal one, there is no such thing as community. There is just a gathering of those with shared interests. The accuracy of prices, it was suggested, is considered necessary to ensure the most efficient use of resources. And such accuracy is of course considered to be created by competition, and competitive exchange. Decision making in this model is devolved, at least in theory, to the rational utility maximizing individual, so that any notion of the common good that is revealed or might evolve by deliberative discourse is to be regarded as suspect or at least a distortion. Now, some very distinguished economists did, of course, engage with this, and they went on to expose the tenuous basis of such an assumption pointing, for example, to what was little less than a galaxy of asymmetries of information in the practical delivery of information to the market. And some of them got the Nobel Prize on the strength of it. <laughs> this version of economic thought in neoliberalism, which became hegemonic in many political settings in recent decades, implied and required a retreat for the stage and other non-market mechanisms from any role in the allocation of resources. Accordingly, it implies the extension of the utilisation of the price mechanism to allocate resources, or to put it another way, the creation of markets to ever and ever more realms of public life. I recognise that only a minority of economists subscribe to the Hayek and the Friedmanesque extremes of the political theory, and fewer still would elevate it to the status of the organising principle of human society. Nevertheless, Neoliberalism appeals to neoclassical economic theory for validation as it seeks to subsume legitimate questions of public policy under supposedly unchangeable or immutable laws of what it suggests is human nature. Reductionist in its assumptions, 
The problem is that the assumptions and the consequences of its overreaching influences on technocratic policy shapers has not been subjected to sufficiently scholarly critique. Worse than that, it has in fact actually occasioned at times some bad-tempered polemical exchanges. We can describe whole policy programmes based on the political theory I have just outlined as neoliberal. I speak of those programmes which are concerned with the creation of markets where there are none, the demand for markets where they are damaging to social protection or participation, or the retreat of the state from control of or intervention in the operation of markets. This evaluation of what was once a marginal theory has required an affirmative decision to withdraw on the part of the state, and often following this to the erection then of elaborate mechanisms to re-regulate re market operations along the lines of elaborated in theoretical economic models. As that scholar of international economics, Susan Strange, says, it is very easily forgotten that markets exist under the authority and by the permission of the state and are conducted on whatever terms the state may choose to dictate or allow. If I may, I wish to illustrate this point by examining the policy-induced changes in inter the international monetary system over the past 40 years. I use the phrase 40 years regularly because we should contrast the last 40 with the previous 30 after 1945. One, the net 30, you have society trying to reconstruct itself, and then you get in the last 40 the tragic sadness of this, what I have been describing. If I might say this, this is how it goes. Let me illustrate the point by examining, as I've said, the policy-induced changes in the international monetary system over the 40 years there. Compare and contrast that policy regime of the post-war years adopted during the 30-year expansion of employment, output and productivity that was adopted between 1945 and 1973. And contrast that with the neoliberal policy regime which gradually replaced it and which still today is embedded in the thinking about international financial markets. For example, when we speak of globalisation, a usage that trips easily of tongues, far from introducing a conceptual system open to scrutiny, we are really referring to the outcome of the policy of the liberalisation of capital markets. At the heart of the post-war policy regime laid the Bretton Woods currency system, which represented a compromise between the visions of the British representative John Maynard Keynes and the New Dealers of the United States. As part of this compromise, a fixed currency based on the dollar, which itself would be convertible to a fixed quantity of gold, was established. That was protected and policed by a system of capital controls, with the addition of flexibility in the adjustment of exchange rates from time to time. The international relations scholar, Professor John Ruge, has referred to this regime as a form of embedded liberalism, as it enabled an element of domestic economy to allow governments pursue national goals and construct national welfare states without the kind of sudden adjustment shocks imposed by balance of payments disequilibria, which so affected national economies under the gold, star, gold standard regime of the 19th century. I should say it's an amusing thing. When I gave my first lectures in economics, you see, the gold standard was still there. And, and I had to become an expert on the Kuwait gap. We must recall that this compromise relied on a dramatic suppression, and this is important, of the role of financial firms in the allocation of resources. And it effectively subordinated the operation of financial markets to state control through the use of the control of movements of capital. As John Maynard Keynes stated, capital controls were to be not merely as a feature of the transition, but as a permanent arrangement. The plan accords to every member government the explicit right to control all capital movements. What used to be a heresy is now endorsed as orthodox. That was Keynes. Time and time again during the Bretton Woods period, governments would use capital controls to maintain their domestic policy autonomy. And, for example, the objective of full employment rather than raise interest rates or reduce government expenditure by way of response to periodic balance of payments crises. The Bretton Woods system came to an end in 1971 
uh, as a result of what has become known as the Triffin Dilemma. And there is an older Polish author claiming credit for this. As foreseen by Maynard Keynes in 44, the use of the dollar as the international reserve currency led to a, cons a constant current account deficit on balance of payments of the United States, as it was required to supply the necessary liquidity to ensure, for example, the, opera the operation of the global trading system. Successive governments in the United States were unsurprisingly unwilling to reduce economic activity through expenditure cuts, interest rate or tax increases, to reduce the current account deficits, but instead relied on the imposition of capital controls. These controls were in turn undermined by the promotion by certain governments of the growth of the euro-dollar market, which became centred in the city of London. The large quantity of dollars built up by United States private and public investment were deposited in international branches of the United States banks at interest rates higher than those allowable by the Federal Reserve during this era. These euro dollars created a quasi-international capital market and pool of freely tradable dollars outside the control of the Federal Reserve, unable then to devalue because of its role as the international reserve currency, unwilling to reduce military adventurism abroad or social prog programs at home, the United States was placed under increasing pressure during the late 1960s by other states, some of whom threatened to redeem their dollar reserves for gold. The pool of euro dollars was becoming a weapon for speculators who were gradually restoring themselves after decades of financial suppression to, to attack an overvalued dollar. Under such intense pressure, unable to compromise any domestic economic activity, the United States, the anchor of the Bretton Woods system, and indeed under some pressure from a piece of adventurism by President de Gaulle, presided over its dissolution in 1971 by suspending convertibility of dollars into gold and imposing emergency import tariffs and price and wage controls. The collapse of Bretton Woods in 71, the oil shock of 73, led to a sharp increase in oil prices experienced as a result of the embargo imposed by the OPEC, Organisation of Petroleum Exporting Countries, and it brought to an end a historic period of economic expansion in the capitalist world. The petrodollars held by the residents of the oil-producing countries were recycled through that euro-dollar market, which in turn, as those of us who were familiar with South American realities in the 1980s will recall, were used to purchase the debt of the governments of the Global South. There was always throughout the 70s and 80s, among some leaders, an awareness of all of this, the consequences of the possibility of international cooperation that might address the joint economic challenges that were now facing both East and West, North and South. For example, we might recall efforts such as the Declaration for the Establishment of a New International Economic Order, adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in April 1974. I recall meeting with Brendan Halligan and Willy Brandt when he came to Dublin, promoting its vision, based as it was on a theory of interest, but open to redefining international economic relations. It demanded the right of developing countries to regulate and control the activities of multinational corporations within their territory. The freedom to nationalise foreign property, freedom to establish associations of primary commodity producers, the provision of economic and technical assistance, the transfer of technology, an international trade order based on, the st on a stable price for raw materials, and generalised non-reciprocal, non-discriminatory tariff preferences. Now, to our ears now, this sounds utopian, but I think that tells us something too the enclosure of the imaginative space of our intellectual work at the present time. As we know, the policy response, as I've described, never came, and the political forces behind that response took a quite different choice and path. And the biographers of Julius Nariri tells us of his coming home from a meeting in Canada at this time, and he wept and he said, they mean none of it. We have lost an opportunity for change. The alternative came to be and the international monetary system was refunded upon the principles of international capital mobility 
and financial deregulation based on the assumption and assertion that private financial institutions would ensure the most efficient distribution of resources internationally and that newly emboldened financial markets would discipline wayward governments through the changes to price of government debt or through capital flight. The, this re-emergence of the global finance, as the scholar Eric Halana has termed it, occurred far more rapidly than trade liberalisation, partly because there were very few costs to a state to it, unilaterally allowing a non-regulated international financial market such as the euro dollar market to emerge. The recreation and the creation and recreation of financial centres thus facilitated a transfer of accountability, involvement, and thus power from the democratic state to the market, and more specifically to new financial conglomerates. These are new phenomena, unamenable with respect to influence in many ways and the influence of, or, of previous forms of mediating institutions, treaties, advocates. Capitalism had changed form, and the counterbalancing institutional forms were slow to adapt. Real-time technology now favoured with its speed the new forms of capital, and previous systems of checks ran after the consequences. The answer to the impossible trilemma then posed by economists that a country must choose between free capital movements, a fixed foreign exchange rate, and an independent monetary policy, was decisively answered by the renunciation of capital controls. Central banks were tasked with controlling inflation, and full employment targets were abandoned. Those countries in fixed currency regimes, such as the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system, opted to effectively hide their anti-inflationary efforts behind a commitment to the mechanism. This became a quasi-constitutional principle, the most often quoted appeal for a solidarity of interests within the Union. Though some of the initial, re re initial interest rate increases and monetary policy manoeuvres of those early 1980s were undertaken under the cover of the monetarist fallacy, one quickly abandoned, one, that one could control inflation by restricting growth of the money supply. I'm inclined to agree with the late Tommy Ballock, who saw in this policy simply the tolerance of high levels of unemployment so as to reduce wage inflation, or what he called the incomes policy of Karl Marx. Beginning in the Anglophone world in the late 1970s, a programme of neoliberal restructuring was pursued through the removal of all constraints on the growth, use and flows of capital and wealth, the privatisation and contracting out of state assets, the redistribution of income through sharp reductions in the taxation of capital income and increases in consumption tax and charges for public services and the use of high interest rates and dismantlement of collective bargaining to control inflation. John Kenneth Galbraith pithily summed it up. The doctrine of the 80s, namely that the rich were not working because they had too little money, and the poor because they had too much. <laughs> As we may recall, one of the effects of the decision to increase dramatically the, in the interest rates in the United States, the so-called Volcker Show, was to increase the cost of repaying the recently issued dollar-denominated debts of the developing world, which had been purchased with petrodollars, often recycled through the euro-dollar markets. This forced many countries through the 1980s and 90s to, the, to turn to the International Monetary Fund to service this dollar-denominated debt. In return, as we're all too familiar, they were forced to accept structural adjustment programmes based on the Washington Consensus, the now familiar neoliberal policy prescriptions of privatisation, liberalisation of capital markets, imposition of what is euphemistic, euphemistically called labour market flexibility. The results are well known. Reductions in economic expansion, exposure to the volatility of international capital markets and increased precariousness for working, worker people. I discussed his role in it with President Kuczynski when I visited him in Lima. Would he do it all again? And he said I would have in fact retained an element of a social floor. He wouldn't have done the Washington Consensus in quite the same way. 
The results are, it is only in the late 1990s that senior officials in the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, began to have doubts about the efficacy of the Washington Consensus. And it is only now that these institutions are beginning to return to some elements of the wisdom of their founding father, the values of their founding, John Maynard Keynes, and to recognise that the control by the state of capital flows in the public interest should, only be, should not only be permitted, it should at times be actively encouraged. Many of the sources of the fractured relationship between citizen and state that you will be discussing today, increasing inequality in income, power and wealth, the breakdown in some countries of any positive relationship between productivity and wage growth, the continuing power of overmighty financial markets in misallocating and distorting investment, the increased precariousness of employment, particularly for young people, and even the reduction in the labour share of the proportion of national income may be traced to the retreat and tra transformation of the role of the state in the neoliberal era. As I have outli outlined, I believe that this commenced in the 70s and still without perhaps the same con confidence as before, continues today. And I want to add one more player to this list, one which is perhaps indeed maybe one of the more important phenomena of the neoliberal era, and that is the growth of the power, wealth, income and influence of the multinational company. This should give us pause for thought, for if we return to the idealised term Friedrich von Hayek had, catalaxy, a combination of those who have a shared interest, there is an implicit assumption that most economic interactions occur between individuals and firms rather than within firms. This lies at the heart of the prescriptions of the role of the market in ensuring individual freedom that one hears from time to time from neoliberals. As the great polymath Herbert Simon observed, a large amount of economic activity takes place within firms through the lines of authority between company boards, managers and workers. The most powerful and insufficiently transparent and accountable economic organisation of our time is the multinational company and the role of such companies in organising production and shaping consumption patterns continues to grow. The United Nations Conference in Trade and Development, UNCTAD, has estimated that 80% of global trade takes place in value chains linked to multinational firms, or as they accurately describe them, transnational corporations. One can understand, therefore, why much of the present public debate about this power and influence has focused on what would be an appropriate manner in which to tax large corporations, and perhaps more contentiously in which state the right to tax appropriately resides. Outside my realm for the moment. I think, however, that the larger challenge before us is to ask a deeper question about why and how some of these organisations earn such extraordinary profits, and why they wield such power over the lives of citizens. We must always recall that when we speak of the market, that we speak, as Herbert Simon reminded us, of large companies with very significant power. That is not very transparent, that is not very transparent, and as so many instances tell us, often claims a new immunity for its actions. For example, internationally in relation to ecological impact, and the threats to the health and indeed the lives of such as indigenous communities. An army of lawyers threatening the people of Edinburgh in villages. We will fight you until the ice freezes over and then on the ice. My friends, I have in recent months had calls to return as I prepare this to the work of thinkers writing in the tradition to which the term enlightenment has been affixed, which in its Scottish expression through thinkers such as Adam Smith and David Hume, affirm that mutual sympathy, the capacity to imagine ourselves in the place of others, and natural sociability constitutes the heart of human motivations. This natural tendency to mutual sympathy, empathy and understanding of the fellow feeling of others is said by Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments to be the foundation for our conception of justice. Humanity's concern for justice is in turn conceived by Adam Smith to be in a passage, famous passage of that same work, the theory of moral sentiments. The main pillar that upholds the whole edifice 
If it is removed, the great, the immense fabric of human society must in a moment crumble into atoms. This concern for justice and the moral philosophy of Adam Smith underpins his answer to the question of what constitutes a market economy. It is a type of society, he tells us. We must recall that any distinction between the market and society was alien to many of the 18th century thinkers, for which the actions of autonomous individuals were assumed as the result of producing and distributing resources with an end of meeting the demand of justice in the absence of a central authority to coordinate economic activity. The contrast, of course, is between the self-interested individual and the imaginative, sympathetic individual. That is the difference between Adam Smith's two great texts, period, moral sentiments, to the wealth of nations. And it is a difference that would be distorted and exploited in its distortion. As that great economist, the late Kenneth Arrow, reflecting on the first book, The Wealth of Nations, observed, we can take it for granted that for society to operate at all and to function successfully in any sense, we must have an ethical code. That is some sense of justice. Conduct of an economy of even the most self-interested type requires a recognition of others or it will not function even on its own terms. Reflecting on this, we can begin to see that one of the most fatal flaws of neoliberal programmes whether it be through programmes of disciplinary welfare restructuring or the creation of internal markets in public health systems, is the assumption and imposition of a model of human behaviour which is quite antithetical to our sense of justice and of ethics. You can answer yourself in your life in the future as to how reformable it is. It will depend on your moral energy. Relocating economic theory within pluralist cultures that can carry a variety of proposals for the inclusion of a test for justice and ethic suggests itself as a basic. I question the capacity of the present, albeit hidden paradigm of policy, which prevails, for example, in the European Union, to deliver the changes so many of your papers seek. You must make your efforts with the material thrown to you, I know, ring the bells that still can ring. But surely you must provoke a critique of the grounding assumptions of the ground that you are attacking. It is surely appropriate that we reflect on the ethical basis of the modern business corporation and the moral environment that is created by the often conflicting expectations regarding corporate behaviour. The frequent setting of expectations, for example, of shareholder value against the moral and ethical demands of the wider community, as if the wider community is to be recognised at all. Dear friends, I'm coming to the end, and what I've said reflects a strong belief, one that I offer with humility. It is just my view. It is that the democratic state as an agent in coordinating economic activity is required to play an important role in these times, and it will be doing so in a new way, that the need for a role has advanced, become urgent, whether those who have responsibility for those in our union or in our member states want to discuss it or not. And that is one of the consequences of the financial crisis. Our new circumstances have emerged almost to us on a form of autopilot. A glaring vacuum faces us they, as a result of the theory of ne neoliberalism, which has been incrementally but dramatically emptied of its content. But it still retains some of its form as policy residuals, survivals, which have served as an obstacle to the necessary tasks of reconstruction. For example, we simply have not had the kind of public discussion regarding the appropriate mechanism to distribute credit in our country, which I believe the crisis should have occasioned. The state has in recent years been very well served by our enterprise agencies, IDA, Ireland and Enterprise Ireland. And I repeat again, our present healthy indicators are due all more uh, to their activities than they do to any prescriptions from Europe. We might, uh, I do recognise the financial adjustments that were made that are stabilising. We might reflect at a time, may I just offer one, I think. This state, as I said, how has the IDA Ireland, Enterprise Ireland helped us? Providing sites, promoting domestic Irish enterprise, in the case of IDA Ireland, ensuring that multinational corporations they have sites. 
As Professor Mariana Mazzucato has said recently, the entrepreneurial state actively creates and shapes market outcomes. And we might reflect at a time of acute housing shortage for a while time, and at a time when the most efficient use of the current stock of housing and of residential land, whether or not is not being made, being made, whether an enterprise agency of similar character to those I have mentioned in those other areas might not be warranted, released and resourced to play a role in the market, one that would show the same urgency in the same Milan as IDA Ireland or Enterprise Ireland, which I recently witnessed during, as I've said, my recent visit to Australia and New Zealand. Why not use such a mechanism to actually address the issue of the dysfunctional market in relation to housing? There is today in this state, after all, a fixed supply of residential building land, fixed by nature indeed, but defined by the planning laws of the state and of course good planning with provision of housing is a necessary part of social cohesion. There is a stock of housing, some of which is empty. There is residential land, which much like the agricultural land in this country in the 19th century, constitutes in some settings, very much like that time, a limited resource controlled by a few. How are we to balance the responsibility of a just use, of a, for a just use, for, for social usage? with the absolutist claims of inviolable property title and usage. It's a great challenge. And it is something upon which opinion has been expressed recently by some members of the judiciary, which is helpful. During the first 60 years of the history of the state, the Land Commission, first established by the British government in 1881, continued its program of intervention in agricultural land, compulsorily transferring underutilised under lands to former tenants. The interventionist role of the state was accepted. The interventionist role of the state has to be adequate for circumstances that change, circumstances that affect the cohesion of society at home and in the European Union. Now, the European Council, Commission and Parliament last week proclaimed the European pillar of social rights in Gothenburg, which I am pleased includes a right to housing. And now I hope that we can look forward throughout the European Union to leadership and institutional innovation and ambition that is equal to the needs of our citizens and demands of the present moment and will turn this right into a reality. As I've quoted Leonard Cole already, yes, we have to ring the bells that still can ring. We must not despair. We should not despair, for markets can be made and unmade, shaped where required to serve the citizen and modified or indeed suppressed when necessary to serve the interest of the public good. States have, over the past 40 years, I've suggested, shaped markets based on an insufficient political theory, insufficient in its conception of human welfare, insufficient in its capacity to monitor its outcomes. And the challenges of the coming decade cannot be met by such outdated orthodoxies. I believe that in our own country, such challenges can be met by drawing on an ethical core that is lodged in the best of our political traditions, forged in the long struggles for national independence, for universal suffrage, for economic, social and civil equality, for the rights of labour, the rights of women, the rights of ethnic and religious minorities. These struggles throughout our history have only been given their fullest expression and their most authentic expression through the demand for a republic of equal citizens, a citizenship which is inclusive, open, generous, joyful, relentlessly committed through the deliberation, disputation and participation of all its citizens in democratic politics, aimed at discerning and achieving the common good. Internationally, we have a foundation for such action in the agreement signed at Paris in 2015, an important moral milestone, as imperfect as it may be, in recognising the demands of climate justice. And in the agreement of the Sustainable Development Goals in New York, in September of 2015, in which over 193 states resolved to end poverty and hunger, combat inequalities and income to opportunity, build a peaceful, just and inclusive society, to create conditions for a shared welfare or prosperity. Are they describing globalisation as we have experienced it? But isn't it far closer to what Immanuel Kant defined as cosmopolitanism in the best sense of the better Kantian writing? And in embarking on the great effort required to achieve our goals, 
We must not and we cannot rely on a continuation of a failure to critique globalisation whose freedom extends only to the liberties of the market with its inequalities and whose vision is so narrow that it can contain but a single ideal of humanity, one formed in its own image. Our gaze must be cosmopolitan, encompassing humanity in all its cultural diversity and several generations to come, for as Immanuel Kant wrote two centuries ago, our innate right to freedom derives from our humanity, our capacity to invent and educate desire, our creative use of imagination and reason, our powers to remember and to anticipate the future, our universal feelings of empathy. So let us then found our efforts on that great ethical imperative he suggested, which is to treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end in itself. The challenge of the future can only be met by a narrative of hope, a recognition that we can and will change our own destinies and our own societies. And the horizons of our hope must be cosmopolitan in character, extending to all the peoples of the globe, across all the generations, recognising that all of us on this planet owe to each other a moral duty to remedy and to prevent the recurrence and endless rebirth of the injustices of this world. Thank you very much, Premier. It's very hard to follow that. <laughs> it is for me to, to thank you, President, for that extraordinary and very wide-ranging uh, speech and uh, a, a history, really, that you've set before us, starting in the immediate years after the war and ending with our housing crisis and a challenge for us to reshape our country and the confidence that you show that we can, as an Irish people, rebuild and reshape the country as we move forward. Uh, I once heard uh, the letter to the Ephesians described as the Grand Canyon of Scripture. I suspect we have another Grand Canyon presented to us today in terms of the depth and size of your thinking, and one that will require con some considerable reflection. And that indeed is the nature of a keynote speech. It's not just to come and lay it out there, but to really challenge people to take something away and think we could do something about that. You started uh, talking about the project of the universal citizen as something that we should aspire to, that um, you talked about the, uh, the contrast between the 30 years after the war when, when go governments of left and right tried to build a, a social response to the, the, the aftermath of the war and contrasted that with what has happened since in the last 40 years. And I was struck by your reference to Julius Nyerere and his justified scepticism that indeed they didn't seem to mean a word of it. And um, so the, uh, we, we, we really do need uh, to, to look at what has happened and indeed some of your comments reflected the, the earlier papers we had of the dismantling of the social and eco economic model and the economic security that has resulted in the increased precariousness in income and employment, particularly for the young people of today. I have a couple of them at home. This is not just theory, this is real practice. And um, indeed, the power and influence of the transnational corporations and their challenge to the way that markets work and how power is distributed I suppose I could go on and on. Uh, President, it was, it was a really uh, very enriching, and I'll not try and summarize at all. Just to say that you have indeed left us with a challenge. Uh, you have talked about the need to rebuild a society based on justice and ethics, and you said to us, we must not despair. All of this can be reshaped, and it's our job, all of us here gathered in this room, and all the organizations we represent, 
to accept that challenge and to get on with it. Thank you very much, and I'd like to present you with the papers of today's conference.